Um, hello. Uh, so joining us uh, is Justin McConnell, director of the uh, new documentary, excellent documentary, Clapboard Jungle. Uh, Justin, thanks for joining us. Where, whereabouts are you at the moment? Uh, I live in Toronto, Canada. So, you know, the, one of the COVID capitals of the world at the moment. Uh, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, I'm. Uh, thanks for having me on, by the way. That's okay. So I, I guess you're in in lockdown then yourself at the moment. Well, we're in whatever we consider to be lockdown. I don't. I, we call it a mockdown at this point um, because it's completely ineffective, and they left uh, way too many. Uh, I'm not going to get into it. Let's just put it this way: we have an, a very ineffective provincial government, and uh, it is. Um, it is not helping the situation necessarily. I'm sure it's it is definitely diminishing case numbers, but it's not effectively diminishing them enough that uh, we aren't going to end up with a fourth wave as well, probably. Right. <laughs> let's put it that <laughs> well, way. On that cheery note, let's let's talk about your films. Uh, so more, more upbeat matters. So uh, for anyone who's not um, not seen the documentary, could you um, tell them a little about a little bit about it? Sure. Uh, Clapboard Jungle is basically a documentary I shot over a period of about five years where uh, I did two things. I went out and I, I got about 120 interviews with people from all over the film business. Uh, and then I turned the camera on myself to track my uh, progress trying to get several films made. Um, and I'm not going to spoil, I mean, if you can't really spoil real life. You can just look it up on Google, but I'm not going to spoil whether or not that actually happened, but it, it exists uh, you know, as sort of a film school in a box for people, but also like an emotional kind of examination of what it sort of takes to be an artist and the kind of stuff you have to put up with. And uh, I, I'm not doing a great job <laughs> explaining it, <laughs> but uh, but basically it, it, it's, it's uh, using myself as a case study um, to hang a bunch of interviews and information on uh, to build a skeleton of a story of, of the entire process of getting a film, any film made and finished and released and out there. Uh, the goal is to sort of like help younger filmmakers and um, artists in general kind of uh, as a sort of guiding light uh, to, to let them decide whether they, the business is for them or not. And, and, and to give them at least a grounding of information that will point them in a direction that may be uh, productive for whatever career they're trying to do. Uh, and then we have a, another, uh, we're in post-production on right now is an eight episodes companion series where I'm not in it and it's talking heads and every episode is a specific topic um, describing an aspect of the film business and, and how, you know, how you handle and or navigate that sort of thing. So it's two different sides. One of it, the documentary itself that Arrow is putting out uh, is a, uh, the more, experiential, emotional, esoteric uh, side of things. And then the very, very practical side of things is the series. Right. Although there's lots of practical in the feature as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, now you, you, you mentioned yourself that it was uh, uh, quite a low point that you started off on. Mm -hmm. uh, and then certainly at the beginning of this documentary, it's you're really starting off at a really low point. Just how <laughs> bad was it for you to, to instigate making this documentary? Well, um, yeah, I was definitely at a low point of my life at that point. Uh, I had just lost my best friend and writing partner of a decade who had passed away in 2012. Uh, I got involved with, you know, uh, you know, as part of that, the fallout of that, I started drinking too much and, uh, you know, eating too much and I gained a bunch of weight. Um, and uh, my career was stalled pretty much. And I well, I wouldn't say stalled, but like, it just wasn't going where I wanted it to be. And I was starting to feel uh, beaten down to the point where I was um, uh, not wanting to throw in the towel necessarily, but just not feeling like I had any real future in the business or that anything would ever really happen while simultaneously also finishing and releasing my second documentary, Skull World in 2013. So toward the end of 2013, that came out. Uh, and partially to get myself out of that mindset and, and like refocus and push forward and, and, uh, and, and be proactive, I decided, well, I, I, I want to make another feature film. Um, and I had no money. And I realized that most of my narrative films would probably take quite a while to get to camera, if at all. So I thought, well, um, if I'm going to be doing this anyway, if I'm going to be trying to get these movies done anyway, I haven't actually seen a documentary that deals with the financing and development side and all the ups and downs of independent film creation. 
So uh, why don't I go out and get a bunch of interviews, uh, you know, with, out, of, out of whatever pocket change I could put together and turn the camera on myself. And that was a practical choice in a lot of ways because I just couldn't afford to follow somebody else. Yeah. Uh, and I would have to live as their shadow for years, which I kind of did for Skull World. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's just that gets in the way of my own path and my own plan. So I sort of simultaneously while trying to get everything else done, I, I shot this at the same time. So yeah, part, it's definitely it, part of it was therapeutic at the beginning and just like, okay, I'm, at least I'm doing something. At least I'm being proactive. At least I'm making something. Um, and then it just sort of blew out of proportion and took on a life of its own over the years because, uh, you know, I kept shooting interviews. I kept shooting and like life happened and things, you know, things would come together, things would fall apart. And I shot basically until I felt like I had an ending that worked, which is just, I had to wait for life to actually come together in that way. Yeah. Because if I ended, ended the movie, well, again, I'm not going to spoil it. Even though yeah, don't, don't spoil the end. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's what I did. I, I've not seen a, you know, there's been plenty of documentaries about filmmaking, but none about the aspect which you touch on which is the really important bit, which is the finance. Um, so ironically, I'm kind of uh, wondering, how did you finance this documentary? Clubber Jungle? I, uh, I run a post-production company. The majority of my money that comes in I have come from clients, distributors and things. And I do trailer editing, Blu-ray and DVD authoring, closed caption services, um, you know, deliverables, final like deliverable files to, to give to distributors and stuff. I'm the guy who creates those. So I make okay money through that. I, I make way more now than I did back in 2013, 2014, because, you know, I, I had a, I still had clients, but it wasn't, but I've been doing this for a long time. Like, you know, Anchor Bay was my client before they died and like I, died is the wrong phrase, but before the company folded and got bought out by stars and Lionsgate, or sorry, got bought out by Lionsgate. Uh, anyway, long story short is that's how I make most of my money. So in order to pay for this documentary, which really was just as simple as like me going around with, you know, a thousand to $1,500 worth of camera gear, um, yeah. you know, as myself without any other crew and shooting these interviews. And then, then it, it basically is just extra money that I, I was able to put aside from my, uh, from my company, from the, the post-production work I do. <clears throat> so I was just sort of like paying out of pocket um, with, you know, as I could, as I went. Yeah. And it's just, it's a cumulative effect of like doing that over enough period of time. Um, I ended up like, if I added it up, I'd spent a fair bit of money, but not a ridiculous amount of money. Cause I didn't have it. I, you know, I still had to pay rent and, you know, yeah. pay food and whatnot. And uh, you know, paying for the flights to all these festivals and markets and stuff isn't cheap. Um, and although I could, I could technically say, well, that was a doc, an expense for the documentary. What really that was an expense for was like career development and, <laughs> you know, going to where you can actually get a movie made. Um, so yeah, that's where the money came from. Essentially it was, uh, was just like, I have client work and then I'm able to put a little bit aside and that is able to finance a trip or finance a little bit of gear or some post-production or something. So you've got, um, a load of really great interviewees in this uh, from a director point of view uh you know paul schrader george romero guillermo del toro um as well as a whole host of others how easy was it to get them on board <laughs> uh some of them were easier than others uh i had first of all for people like Guillermo del toro and george romero i have a great associate producer on the film, uh, Chris Alexander, the former editor of uh, Fangoria, and he was an editor of Room Org for a while. So he's got a long history of already interviewing a lot of these people right. and uh, knew, knows them. So Tom Savini, people like that. Chris is the one who set up most of those interviews. It, it, was, it was, you know, he'd reach out and connect me with them and then I'd be able to, you know, convince them to sit down for the interview. Uh, the Del Toro thing happened because I was hired, this, strangely by Arrow through Chris, I was hired to shoot uh, that talk between Del Toro and Romero uh, when when Romero met Del Toro. That's on the Arrow player right now. So I shot and edited that. Um, so on the same day that we shot and edited that, uh, we we had our, had previously ahead of that convinced Del Toro to do an additional interview on that day uh, on his own. I had already shot Romero's interview the previous year, so it was I think it was multiple angles kind of convincing uh, Del Toro to sit for that. Um, with Paul Schrader, I, I've known Paul Schrader through Paul Schrader's son since about 2004, I'd say. So he was a little easier because Paul Schrader's son, Sam, is, is a pretty good friend of mine from way back and used to come and stay on my couch 
like one month, one month, one week a year in Canada uh, back in the early 2000s. Uh, so it was just a matter of like, you know, and Paul had, has seen my work in the past. And uh, I was even up for a, there was a period of time where he was trying to raise uh, 500k per project for these little movies he was going to produce for independent filmmakers. And I was supposed to be at one point, one of the potential directors on that. It never came together. But um, so I already kind of knew Paul. So getting that booked wasn't super difficult. And I already kind of knew Lloyd Kaufman because uh, traveling to these festivals and markets, you get to meet Lloyd. He's just there. Yeah. So, so uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, it really depended. But but uh, but for other people, it was just as it was as, as simple or as difficult as reaching out to one of their representatives uh, or their publicist and and pitching them on the idea. And it yeah. was harder early on because, uh, you know, when it the, the documentary has nothing, then it's like, well, what is this? Some student thing that no, nobody's going to see. But once I had already booked like John McNaughton and some of the big, like, especially when I had Romero, it was much easier to convince someone, oh, they're doing it. Okay. Yeah. Well, well why not? Let's do it. So yeah, yeah it, it was a steamroll effect for a lot of people. It was just like, get those few initial bigger names and then the rest kind of roll from there. I had a lot of no's though, too. <laughs> so who, who said no? Uh, I'm not going to get into that because it's not, they didn't say no. I don't think anybody said no because they didn't want to do it. They said no because of scheduling reasons. Uh, right. like, okay. It was just like, I, we'd, I'd be in LA for four days and I just couldn't line up a schedule with them in that four day window or something like that, you know? Yeah. So yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to come across like, you know, ungrateful because they actually did take the time to consider it, but it was just, yeah. it didn't line up in the cards kind of thing. So having, made this now and obviously over the five-year period it took to make um how has it made it easier for you to finance future films <laughs> it's not easy for anybody i don't think <laughs> i mean um no i mean to some degree uh like i have a, the, this new documentary i'm doing after this uh, they came from within which is a, a history of canadian horror films uh, that probably I wouldn't be doing that project without this project existing. So yeah. there are certain angles that yes, uh, other projects have spawned out of this, but I don't, I think if it, if I have any sort of easy is again, the wrong word. Um, if I have any kind of advantage now, it comes from additional knowledge and additional network and additional, like just people uh, seeing me more taking me a little more seriously or understanding where I'm coming from or having more perspective on my work and my past and the things I've already done because in a meeting it's hard you can't get that stuff across necessarily um but I definitely do see that the benefit of making this film is like uh there's just more context for who I am and how I relate to the business now so um yeah. there are certain meetings I'll take where my my reputation or my history precedes itself now uh it that definitely wasn't the goal of making this, but it's it's a nice little side effect with some people, I guess. Um, especially people that over the years I've known or I've met with, but they don't necessarily give you the time of the day or take you seriously. There's a number of those people who are now like much more open to discuss possible projects. Um, yeah. So yeah, part, part of it is that, and part of it is just knowledge. You know, you, if you go out over five years and interview 120 people uh, about the film business, and every interview is between 20 minutes and 90 minutes, you're bound to learn some things. <laughs> I guess I guess is the way I would put it. So finally then, uh, having spoken to all these people and from your own experience, what is, for budding filmmakers out there, what is the best bit of advice that you've been given or that you would give? Oh, okay. Well, the cliched advice is to not give up if you really want to do this. I mean, it's a cliche, but it's true. The, the first no you have to overcome in your life is yourself, right? If yeah. you are, are saying, I can't do this, then you've just given yourself the no or the rejection that someone in a meeting might have given you. Um, but I think the reality of it is, is that uh, no, the, 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 the uh, William Goldman quote, nobody knows anything is pretty much true, in, in, at least to the point where or, or to the, the aspect of um, what somebody, what one person tells you is going to work and another person tells you you're going to work is going to work are rarely the same thing. And you kind of have to find the truth between those extremes uh, or the, uh, the, the path through those, those sort of opinions or angles or uh, how can I phrase this properly? If you want to get something done, it may not necessarily be the direct route to get there. 
you may have to take some side trips and reevaluate your process. And, and, um, I, and I think being able to adapt to the challenges that come at you and you end up that end up in your path is, is essential for a filmmaker and realizing that every time something falls apart or every time something uh, doesn't quite work out for you or doesn't, uh, you know, you know, you hit a, you hit a brick wall when you're trying to go through a door. Um, you may just have to check around the side of the building to find the, find the door that you're able to make it through. If, if, if it's, a, it's a sloppy metaphor, but I think, I think uh, there's truth to it in that um, there's, there's always more than one angle to play. There's always more than one approach to take. And if you have your, your head set on one approach, especially if it's a very naive approach of like, I'm just gonna write something good and then somebody's gonna say yes, you could end up spinning your wheels for years and years and years and years. And, uh, and, and I think you, you kind of have to step outside yourself, take an honest look at who you are, what your circle is, what your chances are, and act accordingly. Just, you know, and, it, and I can't be any more clear than that because it's different for everybody. Like everybody has their own set of challenges and roadblocks and things that will stand in the way of getting where you want to be. Um, and the, the only way to really understand what those are is to really take a good personal stock of, of, of you know, who you are and where, you know, where you are and take the next step to get you where you're going without trying to run head first at the door. You know, climb the ladder is the metaphor I use a lot in that documentary. And I think it, I think it, it's, it's apt. I think it makes it, 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 it's accurate to how things actually work in the business, you know. Um, sometimes you get lucky and you, you, you get a really like really immediate, really good sense of satisfaction in that something big will, like for the small percent of people where something really big happens for them quickly, or, you know, it seems like overnight, uh, great. But for most people, you have to sort of just like put in the time and learn and try and um, just try and be the best artist, creative, whatever you are that you can be. And then the rest should follow, whatever that is. Um, you, you just you're, you're not really going to know what that is until you're actually there yeah okay that's great thank you Justin very much for providing what is essentially a, a guidebook I suppose for every budding filmmaker out there thank you <laughs> well that's the hope anyway thank you for having me on that's okay you're welcome thank you bye